Hi guys, my name's Subtutor, I'm the man on the Silver Mountain, and welcome back to Warframe. Now, today we're going to be talking, as me being stood here looking at my little glass thousand year fish uh, may be a bit of a clue, uh, is at the other Codex fragments. Not the, the, the general ones, but the ones from Cetus and from Gara. I don't have many, if all, well, nowhere near all, of the, the ones that come from ghouls, but... I might have to end up going back to the, the wiki to read all of these off and go through those. Um, and again, I will be going through the hidden messages that are in the background of all of these fragments for the the Ostron, the two Ostron myths as well as the um, the backstory to Ordis. But those I want to go through um, in a, a, a slightly different Okay, oh, I had a slightly different occasion. Mostly because I want to go through uh, the Gara stuff first, and then I want to go through the Plains of, of Eidolon stuff, the Cetus stuff, and then I'll probably do the recordings from the backgrounds of these, because then I want to talk about the Unum. I've been itching to talk about the Unum for a while now, um, but, you know, haven't got round to it yet. So, anyway, let's take a look. So, this one, this first one, is uh, about the the children in Cetus. And these are some of the only children other than ourselves that we've seen so far. We've seen, um, arguably, uh, the the children of another group the, in, in Glass's Gambit. We've seen um, the younger of the two queens. But then otherwise, the only other children we've seen are us, the, the operators, the Tenno. So the fact that we see a lot more children running around playing games and messing around and being children, not having to shoulder some great responsibility or be some kind of cosmic space god or, or be some twisted ancient tyrant in a young body. These are just kids being kids. It's an interesting thing to think about um, and puts... and again puts into kind of a stark contrast what our character has been through and how warped we must be emotionally and mentally compared to normal average healthy kids um and again i feel like this is something that hasn't been picked up so much by pd maybe because it's a really dark subject even darker than some of the stuff they've gone into so far in this game but hey ho not pd DE, I'm thinking about something different. Um, anyway, childhood games. The children of Cetus can often be found chasing one another through the streets and around landing bays when not helping their families with chores or running the running of businesses. Uh, traditional games are popular, such as Shunter and Kubro and Vobi. They can be found playing riding sticks or floating boats, boats made of stale, hollowed out loaves of bread. Since the arrival of the Tenno, a new form of play has emerged in which the children act out the tales they have heard of the Tenno. So, this is there are a few things that, that I'm interested in here. Firstly, traditional games like Shunter and Kubro and Vobi, the hell are they? Um, purely because it, it would be interesting to see elements of games and traditions and things like that that have carried over the are just kind of things you know alad v has a, an ancient chess set in his his quarters or um the the sergeant plays with an action figure or the the queens have a ping pong table somewhere you know it would all be interesting to see those kind of things picked up carried on and what these things are might you know be be interesting but also it's that last line since the arrival of the tenno a new form of play has emerged in which children act out the tales they have heard of the tenno so we've become heroes to these kids when in mind and body especially considering we still can't remember an awful lot of went before we're not that different in age um and that I, I feel like that would strike much much more of a chord with us as tenno 
than it's shown to. Um, you know, we've we've got all these children, all these people that to us perceptibly are, relatively speaking, a similar age, a similar level of maturity um, in various ways. And yet there's a lot of hero worship and a lot of other stuff going on which sets us apart. You know, it makes it more apparent that we're apart. Anyway, friendship. The word cetus in the Ostron tongue means landless, cladeless, a body turned to dust, turned to motes on a careless wind. History says the town was founded as a home for anyone, regardless of clade, trade or origin. Friendships last a lifetime here. It is easy to imagine how, in the earliest days of Cetus, with the Eidolons roaming the plains, the walls laid low and the Grenier war parties pressing in, mutual support and protection would have been essential. As times have improved, this trait has become a key part of Austrian culture. Now, this stands out to me um, as an interesting thing because we've not seen as much of this in the other organisations. All of the other organisations we come across, even the other syndicates, tend to be very cutthroat. There's not an awful lot of unity. The syndicates are at each other's throats. If this, if a syndicate, if you worked with a syndicate that is in opposition to this uh, a syndicate uh, that you're, uh, the, to to one extent or another, that's that's, I don't know, Arbiters of Hexis versus Red Veil, I guess, um, then they will send kind of attack squads after you. They obviously don't you know, are working against each other as much as they're working with one another. You look at the, the major factions, you've got one, which is the infested, which just wants to consume anything. You've got the sentients that want to wipe out all remaining human life, seemingly, if not all life so that they can repurpose it and repurpose the, the entire system for their own ends. Then you've got the corpus who are incredibly corporate in their mindset very cutthroat very ruthless in the way that they will throw each other under the bus to get ahead make more profit and then you've got the um the the grenier who are literally just militant conquerors you know unity sticking together these are things that the player base has had to do and even the player base still engages in things like pvp and what have you where it's friendly training arguably in terms of the law but then you look across here and, and these are the only people that we've come across that don't stand apart, that don't act in opposition to anything. They're focused around unity and development. And this is something that arguably the Orokin kind of masses would have had at some point when they were all unified under the the kind of banners of the Seven, as it were. And it's, it's interesting to think that that one thing, unity, is the thing that's been lost by everybody apart from this one group who was in possibly one of the worst situations. Okay, the Glass Warrior. What is known of the ancient warrior known as Gara comes to us from folklore and oral tradition. Tradition, rather. It is said that she was the Unum's closest companion and that when the Lotus instructed her children to flee, Gara remained refusing to leave the side of the one she loved best. When the sentient was done raising a great many other towers, when it turned its myriad eyes and receptors towards the Unum, it was Gara who gave herself to protect her friend, shattering the sentient. The mindless monstrosities that now stride the plains, the terrorists, are all that remain of it. Now this is, this is interesting. We learn a couple of things here. Um, so firstly... You know, folklore or oral tradition are the way that, that things are being learned. And that's kind of interesting considering that we do still have um, Orokin remains with data stored on them. We have some very highly technologically capable groups out there, ourselves included. And yet it's folklore and oral tradition that has seen tales of this particular Tenno or this particular Warframe through the kind of dark age that happened after the Orokin collapse. Um, but it's said that she was the closest companion of the Unum, which I'll touch on more when it actually comes to talking about the Unum in full. Um, but then uh, we also learn here that Lotus instructed her children to flee. 
Now, the thing that's interesting here is we couldn't flee. We were in our stasis chambers in our somatic links on the moon which Lotus shifted out of kind of regular space into the void so when she says instructed her children to flee again part of me wonders if this is um, kind of what we saw was with Sylvanas when it was the Warframe that seemed to act of its own accord coming and following a path that was already laid out for it or that it had adopted for a good period of time during its control by a Tenno that then led it on to do more in this way rather than you know not like I want to I'm, I'm interested to kind of see who Lotus perceives to be her children is it the operators is it the operators and the warframes because warframes are made of people you know it's an interesting thing to to bring about the other thing that, that stands out is that gara being a kind of crystalline glass warrior as per the title here when it says she shattered the sentient and this was a sentient that was seemingly hunhouse sized you know a a considering some of the ruins that we see around the plains of eidolon this was a sentient in control of probably what was a small fleet of sentient kind of uh, proxies at this point so you know it's it's interesting to consider how did she shatter the the sentient and everything so thoroughly to make sure that those ruins actually firstly just crashed down there but also to the extent that all of those different moving parts of the sentient the terrorists the the was it vombalists as well as the the other bits and pieces that we see in the planes how did she make sure that all of that was so ripped apart and shattered completely that it, it wouldn't persist afterwards like part of me wonders Hun Hao allowed himself to be defeated and we've kind of seen this impression of Hun Hao as a Lotus-esque figure with the matte black appearance but cracked and, and burnt and you know I, I, there's a part of me that sat here wondering whether or not um, the sentients have taken on a humanoid form uh, of one sort or another based on one blueprint or another uh, that they've come across and whether or not then taking out the human-esque sentient at the core of things is what shatters things entirely you know uh, it's, it's going to be interesting to see because so far even though we apparently did such a good job of fighting the sentients in the past now they can still be a real pain in the ass if they spring in on you without you being prepared for them Night in Cetus, the distant, moan, mournful howls of the Eidolon, yearning for the terror it once was, drift through the alleys and byways, across rooftops, to the ears of sleeping families. I mean, that's just kind of scary and, and sad, almost, uh, that these people are stuck in the situation where they're arguably safe, but at the same time, there's, you know, you've got families there who have made their homes there and all the rest of it and they have to hear this howling this screaming creature every night you know I, I would imagine that that would maybe take a toll after a time ostron cuisine now this one's just a weird one i wasn't expecting this i was expecting more built out stuff but uh, hey you know apparently part of gara the information from gara is we we learn what the ostrons eat and drink so you got chima which is uh Feel very like like what? In fact, I wonder is there because we know that they eat fish, but uh, because the when we hand in a fish, she oh, I can't remember what her name is now, but the fish merchant, the one that gives you fish fishing spears and bait and whatever else, she turns around and goes, it would feed the whole family and the cousins too. And it's like okay, sure, but then. Like looking at this, it's all apart from the caviar here. Um, oh, lowlands moss. Oh no, that's poop. So they eat poop. 
and they eat plants. They eat fish eggs, fair enough. But then booze, booze, poop. So it's, it's yeah, I, I can't say it's the most comfortable living, maybe, in terms of food in uh, on the plains. But anyway, let's get into the plains. The Plains of Eidolon, the site of a final battle between the Unum's champion, Gara, and the colossal sentient uh, that wished to claim the tower's regenerative qualities for itself. Today, the, the remains of the sentient, diminished and confused, wander the plains, sleeking, seeking cohesion the Ostrons hope it shall never find. Now, the thing that is interesting here is the mention of the tower's regenerative capabilities and qualities. Um... Because we know that the uh, the sentients are damaged by the void and seemingly irre you know, com in a completely irre irreparable way. But apparently the tower has qualities that allow regeneration, not just regrowth of itself, but regeneration in other things as well, but not people. There are un it says that there are unguents and medicines that, that, that are created later on in these, these fragments, but why would those work on ascension begs the question and it's something that i want to get into in my uh the video that i want to do on the unum specifically later on uh ancient history many questions remain what is the true nature of cetus who is the unum and how long has she been one with the living tower what is her relationship to the quills and what hidden purpose do they serve the archivist onko preserved much of the old folklore but how much of that is true? If there is any kind of scheme to the unfolding of things, some end point in sight, then one thing is certain, the arrival of the Tenno in Cetus is no accident. I can't actually remember why we end up in Cetus. I can't remember what the quest was. I seem to remember us just landing. I don't remember there being a summons. Maybe I should go back and check my, um, my mail and see what happens but anyway the tower's flesh canang canang clear ingress 4275 shock charges have been affixed evacuate 500 meters boomwood prepare to make fire prepare to make fire the unum specifies which part of her temple body may be harvested and when in this manner her body eternally replenishes providing her people with flesh to sell, temple couver to refine, and oils with which to make remarkable unguents. On occasion, nestled within the substrata of her being, a rare excuse me, rare discovery awaits, forgotten technology, proto-essence, things which lure travelers from across the system, and so are the bounty of, and so are a bounty for her people. Now, um, you know, we we've just talked about how seemingly the Unum and the Tower are two different things, but they have been bound together. Now, we've seen this in a few places. Us, with the Warframes, uh, Lotus, in terms of it being the Tar and Margulis shoved together, and a few other places as well. But here, especially, there's the specificity between um, kind of Kuva and Temple Kuva, which, you know, I did my What is Kuva video uh, a little while ago. Um, but then... Here we've got all of this extra stuff, but the one thing that stands out isn't just forgotten technology. It isn't temple flesh and kuva and things. It's proto-essence. Now, what is that? You know, what is the proto-essence? Is that the stem cell-esque uh, element to whatever it is that allows the entire tower to regrow? Um, is there something else to it? Is it proto-temple kuva? You know, it's seemingly a, a highly desired commodity, but what exactly it is, what it would be used for, that's the interesting thing to me. You know, that's the interesting unknown. Uh, Ostron Patois. Um, so, in terms of language, we've just got a, a few sayings, a few little bits and pieces here, which, you know, fine. We hear... Kunzu and, and some of the others uh, say this a fair amount and it I feel like it adds a little bit to the place so you know I'm glad that we've got it here as well for those people that can't 
work it out as you're hearing it or when you're just going the the quest giver said a thing i don't know what he was talking about might have been a mispronunciation don't know the um unum uh, gives herself decreeing what parts of the of the, her temple body may be harvested for the good of cetus drillers climbing great scaffolds punch cavities into the temple wall which are then packed with mighty shock charges they call prepare to make fire echoes across the uh, rooftops all know the, uh, to clear the streets and alleys boomwood of the harvest the detonations rupture the sacred flesh freeing great blanket pieces which are in turn pulled freed pulled free rather and rolled down by the use of long bill hooks it is then the duty of the agile balloon drop uh, drivers to deliver the bounty to the butchers below so flensers uh, are those who carve up the temple's flesh so the people that we see when we first land in the cetus who are always dealing with that one piece that they must have done over and over and again over and over and over again about 50 times or 50 million times since uh, the Plains of Eidolon came out. Eruptors, those who lay shock charges along chosen lines and make fire, loosening the carved flesh uh, for removal by balloon. And then retrievers, those who wring all the oil from, uh, from scrubs at the end of a shift. So nothing goes to waste. That's one thing to take away from this one absolutely nothing goes to waste you know they will even from the the clothes that they are wearing that have been soaked in the oil and temple kuva and all the other materials they get wrung out at the end of every day to make sure that not a drop is wasted um right grenier excavations perhaps it is a byproduct of the sentient's body being scattered across the plains it may be that the tower is here for this very reason or perhaps it's just chance but the plains are mineral and resource rich so much so that the grenier risk ostron retaliation and the wrath of the tenno and the rage of the idol on itself to mine this place now the one thing that again stands out to me is that we were seeing in the other fragments the other codex fragments from the main solar system uh, maps the other day when we took a look at this um that the grenier are concerned about fresh water and the one thing that stands out to me here is that you've got a lot of water and it's been infected seemingly by the um the the sentient you know we jump in it and we get uh, affected by it but that hasn't stopped fish from living in it. It doesn't seem to have caused them any harm. Um, it only seems to be particularly virulent at night when the sentient is actually active. And so I'm surprised that they are looking to mine and, and kind of deface this part of the area. I mean, we see them building around sentient structures you know they're obviously looking at sentient tech and wanting to make use of it um as well but you know the thing that stands out to me is that when it comes to them gathering and churning up this part of the map like again you would have thought that this is on earth there they were concerned about fresh water and things before you've got this area it's got large swathes of water both seawater and fresh water there um and yet they're they're looking to mine and dump and and seemingly make a bit more of a mess of this part of the world than otherwise uh right where are we amps the eidolon is no common beast of the plains and cannot be laid low with the tools of an everyday hunter these amps focus the user's will into a killing beam capable of eventually bringing one of these giant monstrosities down now are these amps usable by Ostroms? Because we know that they focus our void power, and our void power is, is crazy deadly by itself, but then attaching an amp to it makes uh, allows us to temper it into the thing that we would want it to be more so. And so that's all very well and good, but it says here that you know, it, it just focuses the user's willpower into a killing beam. 
Now, we've seen other characters, Ballas, for instance, or the Queen, uh, the, the older of the two Grenier Queens, with her uh, scepter with the Kuva responding to her on it, and, and stuff like that. We have heard tell of things like the Punishment Ring with what seems to be the Jade Light. And so it wouldn't, and, and the Lorist equipment as well, actually, that the, the, the uh, ancient healers now effectively use. Um, like that's all very interesting and useful. And it's all stuff that the Orokin used to have. But were these things that the Orokin used to have? Are these the weapons that the Orokin maybe started using? against the the sentience but just didn't work as well because especially when they weren't as cobbled together should we say were they more intelligent in and of themselves and therefore easier for the sentience to take control of you know it's it's an interesting thing to consider that an ostron could potentially use an amp through, to, to just channel their will into a killing beam to kill someone in front of them without anything else um, special, without void energy, without um, any further implants and things, just with them being them and this device. The Quills of Cetus. Secretive and respective, the Quills are the Unum's closest adherents. Strange and reserved, their bond to her and each other makes for a strange relationship with causality. We are each one viewpoint within the myriad that comprises the Unum. We watch, we anticipate, we intercede. Now, this plays into what I want to talk about in my video on the Unum, so I won't go into it too much here, but we definitely see that the Quills have a lot more information, a lot more knowledge, and a lot more capabilities than your average Ostron. Um, most of which focus around um, the, the determination of possible futures. And I feel like that's going to be something that is going to be very important to us as the major story progresses. Merchants of Cetus. Attachment is pain. What you wish to gain or lose is a door behind which lies grace. My door is a shipment of Rubido, and the cost of opening would be 3,000 credits plus tax. Okay. Uh, it's interesting to consider that the, the Ostrons still apply tax. You know. But it's it's an interesting thing here, because th this is... This, idea is probably what keeps these guys competitive against the corpus that turn up. Remnants of the Orokin. The Orokin Empire may have receded into the mists of history, but what it left behind is repurposed by those who remain. I mean, that's that's straightforward. We've seen that time and time again from the very beginning of the game with Vor with his key, his Yanis key in his chest. But hey-ho. The Grenier Tusks, dispatched to the plains to assist in efforts to harness and understand the Eidolons, these shock troops stand vigil over Grenier operations. They, excuse me, they wait for the day when the power of that lobotomized sentient might be turned on their, to their own ends and loosed against the walls of Cetus. So the, the thing that stands out to me here is we know that Vehek is in charge of Earth, seemingly, and he has sent, I guess, these guys here. But then he also sends ghouls here and isn't fussed about the fact that ghouls are willing and able, seemingly, as far as Laura is concerned, to attack their own kind in terms of attack other Grenier. And they want to use the power of the lobotomized sentient to attack Cetus, to take it over, to gain... Oh, excuse me. To gain whatever is in the Unum and gain whatever they can from it, I guess. I'd imagine that the, the Twin Queens probably know more about it and that might be why they press for this to go ahead in spite of the fact that unleashing ghouls and your own forces and infestation and whatever else all in this one place where it's already a mess with sentient activity and with Tenno around and all the rest of it, it seems um, 
bit haphazard or possibly a bit desperate. So, you know, we'll have to we'll have to see. Whoops. But part of me wonders if maybe that'll play if if it'll all play a role in the the revival of the Elder Queen. Scavenging way of life, finding worth in the worthless, the Ostron clade families have built for themselves a bastion from the bones of a once great Oricon citadel. In the eyes of an Ostron, everything may serve a second purpose, and what is valueless now can be turned to serve a useful purpose later. Now, ooh, excuse me. Now, this is an interesting thing to, to take a look at. You know, what is valueless may very well uh, have a useful purpose later. And I feel like this is something that they may not have learned, you know, it's something that's probably been learned through just pragmatism uh, more so than anything else. But I feel like this is something that Ballas kind of sat with as well, where throughout everything, he hated us as the Tenno. He did not like the idea of Warframes. He, he did not necessarily even like Perrin Toll's idea in full, even though he supported it. He did not like the way that certain er like elements of Orokin society uh, were either growing more complacent or forgetful or greedy or whatever else whilst he was still operating. And, you know, each time he did something that was, even though he didn't like it very much, even though he, he kind of wished he didn't have to, he would do something with it. You know, the Warframes and the Tenno, they didn't serve a purpose initially, they were just children that would void possessed devils but then once they got desperate unleashing them in warframes was the way that they could win so they were useless before but then they had a, a purpose they had something that they could be used against and I feel like that's kind of a, a repeating thing in a lot of places apart from possibly the uh, the Grenier and the Corpus where they are much more about to taking control of things from a, a greater time in the past rather than just seeing what may or may not be useful using it in priority order until something becomes useful you know um, harvesting the tower the blanket piece of temple flesh is lowered to waiting butchers and flensers the balloons drop driver holds her delicate craft steady as a great airing board is positioned beneath her cargo the old man gives the order sever the main line. Now, uh, I, I, the old man is in this particular instance is probably just a foreman or something like that. But it's also, or it could even be Konzu potentially for some to to some extent maybe. But otherwise, you know, the old man is capitalized there. It's not just an old man, or so it's either a position held, or this is a specific character that we've not met yet. Just, just a curious thing to point out. Cetus. While their floating markets may ply the rails of the origin system, um, Cetus is the Ostron home, a trading hub where travellers from across the system meet to exchange information, wares, and plunder in safety, protected by the Unum-enforced laws of Barter and Pali, free from the influence of Grenier and Corpus. Now, the, I mean, the Corpus don't have control of this place, but they do come and trade. Uh, the Grenier don't seem to be welcome at all because they just want to destroy the place. But there's one interesting part of this statement, and that is Unum enforced laws. How does the Unum enforce anything when the tower itself is being cut to pieces and it only seems to have protective fields around it? Because also the protective field extends across the land, but it doesn't seem to extend out to sea. And so why the Grenier in, with their aerial capabilities haven't come and attacked from the sea is one interesting point um, especially considering that we know that the uh, the Grenier actually have um, at least one sea base seemingly in the, in the Mariana Trench um, or throughout the Mariana Trench on Earth um, but you know we don't see anyone connected to the Unum in a way that it could enforce laws or do anything 
bar possibly the quills, but the quill, the only quill we need, that we see is Onko, and he's kind of stuck in his little cave hiding from the world and from his wife. Uh, so, you know, the, the interesting thing to say that it's Unum enforced. Unum suggested, maybe. Unum enforced, I'm not so sure. Uh, Ostron artisans. The Ostron mercantile scavenger culture was birth has birthed a rich tradition of art artisans fluent in many styles, able to make use of whatever material is at hand to achieve stunning results. A side effect of temple harvesting is a light rain of gold dust, which could can lead to a degenerative condition known as gilded lung. The need for masks to protect against this has led to a rich mask work tradition unique to Cetus. Now, again, we only see a couple of people wearing masks, uh, really. Um, but it, it's, it's again, interesting to, to, to consider. And I'd be more interested to see um, more masks that aren't just the ones that are, are sold by, was it Nakak the kid? Um, who who sells us the masks kind of on display here? Um, you know, which seem to be kind of papier mâché esque. Uh, I'd be interested to see what more of the adults wear. You know, Onko has his mask. Some of the others have face coverings to one extent or another. But like, what would a ceremonial Ostron mask be? Uh, rising from the lakes at sundown. And returning to them before dawn, these simple-minded monstrosities roam the nighttime plains, howling, searching for a thing they can barely remember, completeness, wholeness, an intelligence and malevolent purpose which, fate willing, they will never return to again. Now, again, this is this is interesting because it's it's these these simple-minded monstrosities that that were seemingly proxies to a greater sentient and you know to one of the controlling sentient minds if you like similar to Hunhao or Natar um, and yet the only as a result the only memory that they have is the last big intent of their their kind of parent sentient I suppose and that was that it wanted to be complete. It wanted to be whole again. And yet they want that, but they don't know where to look. Hence tree branches being picked up as arms and things like that. Uh, the Ostron. I know us for a miracle. A million to one improbability. Our existence is the most fragile of all existences. We could be exterminated tomorrow, yet we have endured by wit alone for millennia. Now... The interesting thing to note there is the fact that they say for millennia. Because so far we don't know how long ago the collapse of the Orican Empire was. And we know that humans live a long time in this universe. Because Darvo being over 100 years old is still considered young. Now, the thing that, that that's interesting here is if it's millennia, i.e. plural then we could be looking at between the fall of the Orican Empire and the rise of the current status quo um, and the, the various factions. We could be looking at possibly a period of time as long, if not longer, than the majority of modern human history in the real world. Which again, makes it all the more interesting the oral histories and other information, even amongst long-lived humans, has existed in some form or, no or another f long enough for us to be remembered and for everybody to know that we betrayed the Orokin in some way. So, you know, it's, it's strange and interesting. But anyway, they've got Orokinka, which are spirit houses for the souls of the Orokin who once inhabited Cetus. By giving them a small house in which to reside, the Ostrons hope the Orokin spirits will lead them in peace, said to be good luck. This is kind of like the Lares um, from uh, ancient Rome, where they would have little house spirits and things like that. Um, so, you know, that's, that's interesting. 
whether or not though this has something to do with the the seeming Coover impressions that are floating around or even the big the, the kind of blue projections of um people in the on the moon and stuff like that whether or not there's actually evidence to suggest that, that there are orokin spirits or souls floating around near or, or kind of focused in cetus uh that would be an interesting question whether they might be in the tower you know the in inside of the tower could very well be more akin to what we've seen on the moon and elsewhere um but i don't think it is and i'll explain more on that idea when we actually get to my video on the unum and then Jungbat urns left outside Ostron doorways filled with fresh water for traveling monks. No one else should drink from them, especially off-worlders. Okay, that's fine. Who are these monks and what's in the water? The, you know, it says filled with fresh water, but is it water containing certain things that, I don't know, the quills might have also used to give them their perspective? Or is it just the you shouldn't be drinking from them because it's bad and these are for monks who have nothing you know le like leaving arms out again interesting kind of left up in the air there plains animals it is my experience of the plains animal uh, of the plains that nature adapts with greater alacrity than we Condrox nest in grenier com towers keeping watch over the gutted sentient husks which kuwaka rodents have transformed into colony nests master uh, Tisane has been of great assistance to my cataloging, striving as he does to tame all manner of wildlife. And that's from Onko when he was still just acting as an archivist rather than being dragged into the quills. Like, I, we, we see these creatures around. Uh, part of me thinks that the number of creatures that we actually see is on the smaller side, personally. Um, but again, a lot of the species that may have been there may very well be regularly wiped out like larger species may regularly be wiped out by the eidolon waking up every night so you know maybe it's not as unexpected as it could be but you know i would imagine there'd be a few things here and there life in cetus the cry of seabirds the delicate permeating scent of temple blood the laughter of children and the shouts of merchants and hawkers the roar of approaching spacecraft, the distant haunting howls of the Eidolon Cetus. Not much ruffles in Ostron. Uh, it is as if they have made peace with whatever will be. The closeness of the Unum provides a kind of comfort off-worlders suppose. Or perhaps some of the sanguine knowingness of the enigmatic quills has rubbed off on them. Now, there are, uh, again... We've got two things that stand out here. Firstly, this is the place where we're, we're hearing temple blood being directly re referred to. And the one the, the materials that we hear coming from the the, the temple, from um, the Unum, uh, from the tower, uh, is otherwise referred to as temple kuva. But here we're having it confirmed to be temple blood. You know, they seem to be one in the same. And there's there are a couple of things that I want to go into about that in another video with the Unum stuff. Um, as it's it's very interesting that that's the case, um, but then also it's it points out that it's a delicate smell, which you know you, any of you that have smelt blood, especially kind of that's been splashed or that's congealing, um, it's it's not usually the nicest of smell. I would definitely wouldn't describe it as delicate. So you know, the the permeating scent of it being a delicate thing that's that's there is interesting suggests a couple of things maybe about what could be in it um and then saying you know you've you've got these people that are just accepting of of as, as, a, as a culture they're very just accepting of what's going on they don't tend to get stressed or ruffled by things and maybe it's the this the the knowingness of the enigmatic quills but again the thing that i would point out here is we've just had temple blood referred to and now it's the sanguine knowingness. And I wonder, you know, I'm, I'm genuine, you know, genuinely thinking that the the quills are connected to the unum through ingesting its blood directly, um, without restraint, uh, without refining or anything else like that. They have just consumed it, and it's connected them to the tower. 
uh, which we see a couple of other places as well in, in the myths that uh, are told through the background um, of these, the, the hidden messages in, in these uh, videos, videos, in these uh, codex fragments. Um, and so, yeah, the there's a potential that maybe there is a rubbing off effect, but not in the way that it's just, oh, they've just accepted things from other people. Maybe the the fact that the blood of the Ostrons and the blood of, of the Tower being mixed has, has actually allowed them more intuition and a greater level of comfort. And then the last one. If the Unum speaks to you, Traveller, it is because you have the ears to hear, though at first you may not believe it so. The being known by the Ostrons as the Unum and the ignorant offworlders as the Wall has a reputation for prophecy. Those wealthy enough to own moons have journeyed to Cetus, hoping to buy an audience. But the Unum has no use for wealth, and she alone decides who will hear her words and when. Ostrons believe she sits at the pin center of the universe, listening to the infinite poetry and uh, of cause and effect. Some visitors to her chambers leave bitterly disappointed, others elated, others furious, but one thing is certain, the information she imparts changes the person who receives it. Now, I don't want to go into this too much on the Unum side of things just yet and, and pull out all the parts that are most inter interesting to me about the entire tower and its role and some of the other stuff that's going on. Um, but the thing that stands out to me is, yes, we don't know about the Unum. We're not going to have anything definitive about the Unum for a while. And even when we do get something about it, it's probably not going to be all that big. Going inside the tower, getting across to it, probably going to happen at some point. But the thing that stands out to me is D have been talking about how they wanted to add choices. And we've got our little alignment thing now but it's been underused and they, they have said that they, they want to do more with it, but also at the same time, it's difficult to do more with it and we might see more, We might, but it probably won't be to the extent that they would want to do it and all that kind of thing. But the thing that stands out to me is here it says that one thing is certain, the information that she imparts changes the person who receives it. I think the Unum is going to be the means by which we get probably one, maybe two, large reveals about our past or possibly about what other characters around us that then allow for growth in the story especially considering Ballas has dragged um, Lotus away and there may be an awful lot of information that we need about Ballas and about Lotus in regards to whether she's Margulis, whether she's Natar, whether she's this weird combination of both but then also we don't know there's so much we don't know about ourselves still and our entire lives that our characters had before uh, after they came out of the void but before they betrayed the orokin and went into stasis like we don't know, even know if we definitively did betray the orokin there's so much additional information there that we do not know and the the unum could tell us all manner of different things that could change our perspectives, that could change us as people, that could help our characters grow, that could give us as players insight into things that are troubling or scary or whatever else. Um, but it's it's weird like that, and we're, we're going to have to wait. The other thing that stands out to me, by the way, is this image where you've got the tower there, that seems to be Cetus in the background, but then you've got this structure with this pad here that seems to be quite far removed and out of the way, and I wonder if this is where Onko and the other quills come, where it's just this one secluded little comms relay to communicate with the Unum, if this is more than just concept art. I mean, it is in the game as is, so I'm assuming that this is part of the world, but hey. Anyway, guys, I... Uh, Love to hear your thoughts on, on all of the, the bits and pieces. Are there any things that I missed that I've not pulled out? As said, if it's about the Unum, yes, I'm going to be doing an entire video about that at some point because there is so much information, so much stuff that we get told tangentially and in interesting little ways. Um, and also, I want to go through the, um, the, the hidden 
messages in Gara's and in the Cetus Codex fragments because the tales that they tell give us even more information about the Unum and what's gone on with it in the past. But anyway, guys, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the video tomorrow. Take care. Thank you very much for watching, guys. If you enjoyed this video or found it interesting, then please drop us a like, share this video, and subscribe for more. And I'll see you in the video tomorrow. Take care.